Hello and welcome to lecture 2 of Electric Current in Phys 1204. In this lecture we're going to see Ohm's law, which is the law that governs how much current flows through a circuit element when a particular potential difference is applied across it. I'm going to be talking a lot about current as a quantity which is presumably measurable, but I've never explained how we actually do measure current, and there's a good reason for that which you'll see in a moment. Well, current is a rate at which charge is moved from one place to another. How would we measure that using physics that we already know? Note, I mean, your answer may be, well, Jeff, I'm going to hook an ammeter up and that measures current. But what I'm really asking is, that ammeter has some physical process going on inside it. How do we build devices with physical processes that we can use to measure current? Well, here's a way, although it's not how an ammeter works. Imagine we have a pair of capacitor plates, and we put a probe charge in between so that we can measure the force on that probe charge. And remember that the current is the rate at which charge is going to be transported from one capacitor plate to the other. So, as charge is transported, the E field inside the capacitor increases, and the electric force on our probe charge will increase. And so we know that we can relate that electric force to the amount of charge on the plates, and so we can find the charge on the plates at different times. We could plot that up, and now the slope of that graph is the change in charge on the plates per unit time, and that is the current. But note, this is a highly impractical way of measuring current, which is why ammeters don't do it this way. The actual ways we measure current involve magnetic interactions, which is the next topic of the course. The reason that I went through this discussion of how to measure current using physics we know was simply to demonstrate that this is in principle a measurable quantity, and so we can talk about it as something that we would know the value of somehow. There are some simple things to observe in experiments on current. First of all, if you connect two different wires up to identical batteries, and the wires are made of the same material and the same length, then you'll see that you get a larger current through thick wire than through thin wire. Similarly, using two wires that are the same thickness but different lengths, you will see that the current through the short wire is, l is larger than the current through a long wire. But the material the wires are made of also matters. Some materials conduct better than others, and so for example with otherwise identical wires you'll see a larger current in a copper wire, for example, than in a lead wire. The first, the thickness and the length, are geometric properties. They're properties of the shape and size of the conductor whereas the material property is something separate. It's not to do with the shape, it's to do with what the conductor is made of. So when current is flowing in an object, that means charged particles are moving. And for any object with charged particles moving through it, we can define cross-sectional areas that all of those particles must move through. And so we're talking about motion of objects through some cross-sectional area. This is a flux. Current, then, is a flux of charge through a surface, whereas electron current is a flux of electrons through a surface. This means it's an awful lot like the musician flux and the air mass or air volume flux that we saw in the Gauss's law unit. And unlike electric flux, this is a true flux of objects moving through an area. And so, just like the musician flux and the air flux, we expect that it's some density, in this case it'll be, say, a density of electrons, times the cross-sectional area times the speed that the charged particles are moving at. Because we can't see charge moving through wires, it's useful to have analogies to think in terms of. So let's think about how we would find an expression for traffic rate in cars per hour for cars going down a highway. And so in particular what that means is that if we were to draw a line across the highway, we want to know the rate at which cars cross that line. 
So it's going to depend on several things. It's going to depend on how fast the cars are going, how many lanes there are, and how many cars there are in a given length or the separation between cars. More useful than the separation between cars would be something that we might call a car density. And so let's just say if there were a hundred meters between cars, then the car density would be 10 cars per kilometer in one lane. And so note that this kilometers times lane is essentially an area. So now we can think about how many cars will cross this line. And in particular, we could think about in the next hour how many cars will cross. So somewhere way down the road is the point where the last cars that will cross in the next hour are. And if they're going 100 kilometers per hour, then that point must be 100 kilometers away. But more generally, that means that this is a distance that is just v delta t. And so now we can say that the number of cars that are in this piece of the highway is just going to be the density times the size, which here is an area of that piece of highway. And so that is going to be the car density times the length of that piece of highway times the number of lanes. And so now our car current, which I'll call I sub C, is just the number of cars per unit time. And so all we're doing is dividing out the delta T and it's rho V N. And note that that has the form we expect for a flux. It contains a density, a speed, and the number of lanes is not a cross-sectional area, but it's analogous to a cross-sectional area. Well, let's check your understanding of this set of ideas, because it's exactly the same as current in a wire. So let's suppose we have heavy traffic going down a highway, and as shown, there are two lanes blocked off for construction. And so we would say that the highway is narrowing at that point. Now we would like for there to be no buildup of cars here where the highway narrows. In other words, we don't want a traffic jam. Let's assume the drivers maintain a constant following distance and we want there to be no buildup. Then what do the drivers have to do as they go from the wide piece of road into the narrow piece of road?